The infamous downfall of Blackbeard. Teach's downfall occurred in late 1718 when he took his ships to the coast of South Carolina and created a blockade. This blockade generated panic in the region and also resulted in a significant amount of looting. After settling his issues with the locals, he then traveled up to North Carolina, where he asked Governor Charles Eden for a king's pardon in return for giving up his piracy. Though some were surprised, this pardon was granted, and many believed this was the end of the infamous Blackbeard. They were unfortunately wrong. In November 1718, Teach returned to piracy by capturing two French ships off the coast of Bermuda. These ships contained precious cargo, including cocoa and sugar. When he returned with the ships to North Carolina, he convinced Governor Eden to declare one of them abandoned, which gave Teach legal access to the cargo. It is uncertain whether Eden was fully convinced the ship was simply abandoned at sea or if he decided to collude with Teach in exchange for some of his loot. Regardless, this move made surrounding governors and lieutenants wary of Eden, and one decided to stop Blackbeard himself without permission. Lieutenant Governor Alexander Spotswood of Williamsburg, Virginia, decided to be the one to fix the Blackbeard problem. Fearing his colony would be looted, since they had more precious valuables than North Carolina, he had to move fast. Spotswood launched a raid on North Carolina, which included a British naval force instructed to advance on Teach's ships. Teach refused to submit to the ships, and not having any guns, the crews on board had no choice but to fight Teach and his men with their own weapons. This was a risky move, as many had heard about Blackbeard's skills in hand-to-hand -hand combat, though none had seen it in person, without cannons, though they unfortunately had no choice. Robert Maynard, a Virginian lieutenant leading the naval ships, decided to play a trick on Teach and his crew to give his men some leverage. During the fight, he commanded his men below deck to convince Teach that they were dead or had been thrown overboard. Once Teach fell for this and set foot on their ship to seize it, Maynard and his men rushed at Teach from below in a surprise attack. Unprepared, Teach took several fatal blows before succumbing to his wounds and dying. It is recorded that at the time of his death, he had been shot five times and stabbed twenty. Because of the severity of his wounds, it is uncertain which of these was the final fatal blow to Blackbeard. Maynard had his men decapitate Blackbeard's body and string his severed head from the bowsprit of Maynard's ship. This display was a show of strength to the citizens of Virginia and North Carolina, especially to Governor Eden, whose reputation never fully recovered from his public relationship with Teach. After pulling into port, Maynard stuck Teachy's head on a pole at the entrance of Chesapeake Bay, at Blackbeard's point on Hampton Creek, to warn other pirates to stay away from the region, lest they fall to the same fate as the infamous Blackbeard. The head remained on that pole for several years, until it was little more than a decaying skull. Blackbeard's Skull, Lost to the Sands of Time There are many stories about Blackbeard's skull, some being based on fact and others pure fiction. The mythological tales of Blackbeard's skull include stories of Blackbeard's ghost wandering the Chesapeake Bay searching for his lost head. Others say that after he was decapitated, his body was thrown overboard, where it circled the ship seven times before sinking. Unexplained light sightings have been reported around Chesapeake Bay, with locals calling the lights Teach's Light. More legitimate reports have claimed that Blackbeard's skull was passed around from person to person for the last several hundred years, once it was removed from its pole on the beach. Many claim that it was coated in silver to become a drinking bowl, which was used at dinner parties along the coast. The use of this bowl often led to solemn discussions about pirates and their tragic, brutal fates on the eastern U.S. coast. The skull was also reported to have been a central part of some fraternity rituals in the New England area. However, none of this has been fully confirmed. Throughout the 1900s, the Blackbeard skull was supposedly in the possession of writer and collector Edward Rowe Snow, an author and historian from Massachusetts. In the 1990s, after his death, the skull was donated by his estate to the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts. 
Unfortunately, the skull is not on display at this museum because there is a significant lack of evidence proving that the skull indeed belonged to Blackbeard. They cannot in good faith display it as such. Some museums, such as the San Diego Maritime Museum, have borrowed the skull for temporary display, including of course a disclaimer about its uncertain origins. It is unknown whether the skull will someday be on permanent display, or if more evidence will arise to clarify the origin of Blackbeard's silver-plated skull. Records of the family that donated the skull only goes back so far, and the origin of the skull remains uncertain. Those who claim it's the genuine article explain that there would be no point in faking that it's Blackbeard's skull, while those claiming it's a fake say it's simply wishful thinking. Whether it was preserved or lost to the sands of time, we may never know what happened to Blackbeard's skull during the last 300 years. Perhaps his ghost finally found it after a long wandering on the Chesapeake Bay.